So without too much further ado, let's remind you that this seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time. We can discuss live, but if you want to know what's coming up, click like and subscribe. We very much appreciate it. And I think it's time we dive into it. I'm your host, Zlatko Minev from IBM Quantum Research. And on this episode 122, I have the delight and pleasure to introduce you to Professor Sean Carroll. Hello, Sean. Hi, Zlatko. Um, and let us know where you're tuning in from. I'm in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. I'm at my house, which is not quite my office at Johns Hopkins, but it's just a couple minutes away. All right, lovely. Well, Sean, I don't think you need much of an introduction, but allow me in lieu of a uh, four-hour tradition to proceed. Sean is the Homewood Professor of Natural Philosophy from Johns Hopkins University and Fractal Faculty at Santa Fe Institute. Going back in time, Sean received his PhD in 1993 from Harvard University, followed by postdoctoral studies at MIT and UCSB before joining the faculty at institutions like the University of Chicago and Caltech. Since then, uh, Sean has also expanded his, uh, his uh, creative side, and a science magazine has summarized it. Sean is also an accomplished science writer, a talent with few peers, having authored a number of popular books, most recently, The Biggest Ideas in the Universe, Volume 1. And I think, Sean, we're avidly waiting on Volume 2. It's... Uh, it's, of course, ambitious but, uh, to put that in the first title. <laughs> I was appreciating that right before you kicked this, we kicked this off. Needless to say, Sean is the recipient of way too many prizes to name, including from the APS, NSF, NASA, Packard, Sloan, AIP, AAAS, and even the Guggenheim Foundation. Of course, you can also tune in weekly with Sean on his Mindscape podcast. So with that, Sean, it's our absolute delight and pleasure to have you here, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, as Latko mentioned, uh, I have a podcast called Mindscape. And if you're a Patreon supporter to the podcast, you get to ask me questions in the Ask Me Anything episodes. And a question I recently received was, you know, you talk about quantum mechanics and quantum computing. So do you program using Qiskit? And I, I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. I had to Google it. I didn't know. Uh, I'm, I, I always feel like the time has moved too quickly for me to catch up on these things. But now I know, and I, I think it's a great thing. So I'm very privileged to, uh, to be here giving the seminar, especially because I'll be talking about my two favorite subjects, quantum mechanics and space time. Now, quantum gravity is, of course, a very popular topic, but the arrow of causality or emergence here is very important. I'm not going to try to be quantizing space time, but going from quantum mechanics to space time, which is sort of the moral of the story. So just to drive home, you know, the, if you if you fall asleep for the next 55 minutes, this is the part I really want you to take home with you. When we learn quantum mechanics, right, when we start our, let's say, second year undergraduate course, when we learn about the Schrodinger equation, etc., we generally start with a classical theory and we're taught how to quantize it, right, how to turn it into a quantum mechanical theory. And that's fine. It works for many things. But there's no guarantee that it's going to work. And in fact, we know that nature doesn't do that. Nature doesn't start with a classical model and quantize it. Nature simply is quantum from the start. And this procedure of quantizing things isn't unique, isn't always well-defined, isn't guaranteed to get us to every possible quantum theory. So the inverse problem is very, very important. It's more like what actually happens. Given a quantum theory, what kind of classical limit can you derive? And one of the motivations for digging into this at a very careful level is, of course, quantum gravity. When you take Einstein's general relativity and quantize it, it basically doesn't work. You, basically speaking, do not get the quantum theory of gravity that you want. So maybe the answer is we shouldn't be trying to quantize any particular classical theory of gravity, but rather just starting with quantum mechanics and see if gravity can emerge. And I think that the tentative sign is that, yes, it can, if we think about it in the right way. So I'm going to repeat myself, but in a little bit more detail here to explain what I mean by this. Here is a classical theory where in the Hamiltonian formulation. It's a theory of one particle in one dimension. So there's a Hamiltonian of X and P, right? And you write it down. And then you're taught how to quantize this one particle in one dimension. There's many different ways to do this. You know, the Heisenberg picture, Schrodinger picture, et cetera. In the Schrodinger kind of understanding, you posit a wave function 
So you take either x or p, one but not the other, and you make complex valued square integrable functions of that variable. So let's say psi of x. So psi is a map from the positions to the complex numbers. It's square integrable. And then you can implement things like the momentum as operators on the space of those functions. So momentum is minus i h bar d by dx. And therefore, you can plug in x and p into the classical Hamiltonian and get a quantum version of the Hamiltonian. And then you say that the wave function satisfies the Schrodinger equation, h psi equals i d by dt psi. So all that's very well and good. I'm not going to challenge any of this. I'm not going to say that this is wrong. Uh, if you are doing this and you are John von Neumann, you notice that these wave functions you've defined form a vector space called Hilbert space, which I'm sure you've all heard of before, or at least I'm told that you've all heard of this before. Apologies to anyone in the audience who hasn't, but you can get the spirit of what I'm saying, I think, anyway. So what is a Hilbert space? There are details because Hilbert spaces of interest are often infinite dimensional, but we say that it's a complete complex normed vector space. That is to say, instead of thinking of the quantum state of a particle or some other system as a wave function, as psi of x, as an assignment of a complex number to every different position, and then the probability is that wave function squared, you can think of psi of x as a certain way of represent, representing a more abstract unified thing, the quantum state. And in direct notation, this would be written as the ket psi. It's possible that I have a laser pointer here. Yep, there it goes. So this is a vector, the ket psi, that is an element of this Hilbert space. And then you can uh, multiply those vectors by complex numbers. You can add them together. You can take their inner product. That is a Hilbert space. There you go. And so the reason why I'm emphasizing this, even though I know that you know it, is that in a very real sense, that vector in Hilbert space is a more fundamental thing than the wave function. The wave function is a particular way of writing the vector. It is a particular choice of basis for the vector, but it's not what we care about. What we care about is the vector, not the choice of basis. So if someone asks you, what are the pieces of data that define a quantum mechanical theory? There's not a lot that goes into it, really. There is a choice of the dimensionality of Hilbert space, because Hilbert space is a vector space. There's no different kinds of Hilbert space except for different dimensionalities. And then the Hamiltonian, right? The Hamiltonian tells you how the wave function evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. Secretly, of course, I'm assuming something like the Everettian or many worlds version of quantum mechanics, where there's no hidden variables or spontaneous collapses, anything like that. If you uh, are not already on that bandwagon, I can recommend you a good book to buy uh, that will convince you. Now, there are, I, I have to admit, because people immediately bring this up, if the dimensionality of Hilbert space is uncountably infinite, then it is not sufficient to simply give me the dimensionality of Hilbert space and the Hamiltonian. Different choices of observables, different algebras of observables can lead to different quantum theories, because basically they pick out different states within Hilbert space as being the physical ones. So I'm going to ignore that problem, but I'm going to claim it's OK for me to ignore that problem, because I don't think that the dimensionality of Hilbert space is uncountable in the real world. Of course it is for many very interesting models that we use, like the single particle in one dimension or like quantum field theory. But the real world has gravity in it, and I think that changes the game in an important way. Stephen Hawking told us a long time ago that black holes in theories of gravity have an entropy. And if you believe that entropy represents entanglement between the black hole and the rest of the world, the most important feature of that entropy is that it's a finite number. And a black hole is supposed to be the highest entropy that you can fit into a region. And yet it seems that there's only a finite amount of entanglement that we can put in there. What that means is there are only a finite number of degrees of freedom, quantum mechanically, that live inside that region. The hand wavy way of saying this is if you try to make more and more quantum states inside a region, eventually you need to put more and more energy in there. And in a theory with gravity, you're going to be limited by collapsing to a black hole. You can't make a black hole bigger than the region that you're limiting yourself to. So the Hilbert space that describes any region of space seems in the real world with gravity to only be finite dimensional. Now, the, it might be a very big number, the observable universe we live in has a Hilbert space of something like 10 to the 10 to the 122 dimensions. But that's still less than infinity 
And what it means is I don't need to specify the algebra of, of observables or anything like that. The observables are all Hermitian operators, and that's it. So as a consequence of this, getting rid of the technicalities with big Hilbert spaces, there's very little information that we have to work with in principle when we say I have a quantum theory and I would like to derive the classical limit of it or more than one classical limit if those exist. We're saying that the fundamental theory of everything is a quantum state as a vector in Hilbert space evolving according to the Schrodinger equation. And when we do, when in the real world, the people here in the audience, when you do quantum mechanics, you're cheating a little bit. It's okay that you're cheating, but you should know that you are cheating. You're cheating because you know what the best basis to work in is. You say, oh, I have an electron. It has a spin. I have another electron. It has a spin. I have two individual Hilbert spaces for both of them. I tensor product them together to get the whole Hilbert space. But that's because you already knew that you started with those subsystems. If you start with the whole Hilbert space and say, how should I best divide it up into subsystems to describe the physical world, that turns out to be a hard problem. Again, you might think that I can just look at the Hamiltonian, right? Here's a Hamiltonian for the harmonic oscillator. If you are either an expert in quantum mechanics or have very recently taken your first intro to quantum mechanics course, you instantly look at this and you recognize it. It's the harmonic oscillator, okay? But we are benefiting from the fact that we've written this Hamiltonian in a very specific basis, in the position basis. How did we know to use that? These are questions we're allowed to ask ourselves, questions that have been mostly ignored over the history of quantum mechanics. So what we want to know is, can we just start from pure Hilbert space type concepts, okay? Vectors, Hamiltonian, entanglement, things like that, and derive all of the language of the classical world from that, space itself, fields, particles, forces, all of that stuff. And we're not allowed to pick out the best or the most useful basis for Hilbert space to start with, we have to derive that too. So the only invariant information we have is actually the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. If all you have is the Hamiltonian, the only preferred uniquely defined basis you have to work with is the energy eigen basis, right? The states for which H hn equals en times n. And therefore, all of the information that we call the Hamiltonian can be thought of as expressed in this basis where the Hamiltonian is diagonal. So the Hamiltonian really is just a list of real numbers. The eigenspectrum of the Hamiltonian, or just the spectrum for short, the energy eigenvalues of our theory. So our self-appointed task is to go from some very, very large list of energy eigenvalues to the real world, to in this case, this is the effective field theory action for uh, the standard model plus gravity, for example. How do you derive all of this, the fact that there's Higgs fields and gauge fields and spontaneous symmetry breaking and curved space time? How do you derive that from a list of real numbers, namely the energy eigenvalues? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> so I'm gonna, we, I think we have very good first steps toward answering that question. We know what we need to do. We've done some of it, but we haven't done all of it. This is very much an ongoing project. And it, it helps a little bit to step back and think about, you know, when we wrote down that simple harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian, how did we know that that was a good basis, the position basis for the harmonic oscillator? How do we know that was an interesting basis to use? Well, in the real world, the reason why the position basis always suggests itself to us right away is that that's what we see when we look at things. You know, we look at an object in the world and we see its position. You might also see its color or whatever. But from moment to moment, we see a bunch of positions of objects scattered throughout space. So what that is telling us is that if you don't want to think that we are spooky, conscious things, uh, if we are physical subsystems of the universe ourselves, then the fact that certain bases for subsystems present themselves as the right ones to think about has to do with the relationship between those subsystems and other subsystems. So there's a system we're looking at and there's the observer, right? Which I'm gonna consider as some physical apparatus, some physical subset of Hilbert space, just like everything else. In yet other words, there are many ways to decompose Hilbert space into interacting subsystems. Some of those ways are gonna be useful. Some of them are not going to be useful 
how do we find out what the useful ones are? So what, what do you mean by useful? Well, for one thing, it's going to be that they act classically, but there's going to be other, uh, other things to keep in mind as well. So this question is what is known as quantum muriology. Muriology is a word the philosophers use to describe the relationship between a whole and its parts. Holes and parts are muriology. It's not metrology or meteorology or anything like that. It really is muriology. So carving Hilbert space into subsystems. And the way to think about our project is to imagine someone suggests to you a way of carving Hilbert space into subsystems, by which we mean a tensor product factorization. So you say that the Hilbert space is HA tensor into HB. And as soon as you do that, there is now some structure that you can use to think about the Hamiltonian. You can write the Hamiltonian, which is the only other thing you have, as a part that only works on system A, a part that only acts on system B, and then an interaction between them. So this is the setup we want to use to ask what is the most useful way out of all the possible, the infinite number of factorizations we could look at, which are the ones that give us something to hold on to, some classical limit, some other nice behavior in some sense. So let's think a little bit more carefully about when I say the classical limit, what do I mean? Because again, if you are either an expert in quantum mechanics or recently took your course, maybe you think you know what is meant by the classical limit of a quantum mechanical system. It has something to do with Ehrenfest's theorem, right? If you have a wave packet that is relatively localized on the scale of the variation of the other fields, et cetera, et cetera, the expectation value of the variables describing that wave packet satisfy classical equations of motion. That's all very true, and that's very important. It is also only half of what you need to get a classical limit out of a quantum theory. Think about Schrodinger's cat, okay? I'm a cat person, so I don't like to kill the cat. I think of the cat as being in a superposition of awake and asleep. And if you've thought about decoherence at all in your life, or pointer states, or quantum Darwinism, or any of these other buzzwords, you know that there's a reason why when you open the box and look at the cat, you either see a cat that is awake or a cat that is asleep, not a quantum superposition of both. In Hilbert space, there's no problem in writing down a superposition of awake and asleep cat, but we never see that with our eyes. Why not? And this, this, this question is answerable. Okay, We know the reason why not in terms of pointer states and decoherence and so forth. I'm not going to tell you the, the details of that, but hopefully you know the basic idea. The, the one idea to get across is when you have a macroscopic system that is not a pointer state, a pointer state is one that is robust under being monitored by the environment. So a cat that is purely awake or a cat that is purely as asleep, those are pointer states. A mixture, a, sorry, a superposition, I should say, would not be a pointer state. And the difference physically is that a non-pointer state will quickly become entangled with the environment. So here's an image of a photon that interacts differently with the awake part of the cat and the asleep part of the cat. So if you think of these photons as being part of the environment, part of the bath of photons and so forth in the box with the cat, they will quickly become entangled because they interact differently with the different parts of the superposition that defines the cat. That, all, that we all know, that you've been taught. But then the other thing to keep in mind is once that happens, once you have a branch where the cat is purely awake, the entanglement stops happening, right? Photons can bump into the cat. They can be absorbed or they can bounce off or whatever, but they do it coherently with the cat all as one thing. So they don't become entangled. They interact, but they don't entangle. So it is a feature of the classical limit that pointer states exist and those pointer states don't rapidly become entangled with their environments. So there are two aspects of classicality, the one that you've all been taught that localized states remain localized, and the second one that is implicit, which is that unentangled pointer states remain unentangled. And we can use both of these features of classical behavior to answer our question, how should we divide Hilbert space? So we start with nothing but Hilbert space in the spectrum of Hamiltonian. That's all we, that's all we are able to work with. Those are the tools we have in front of us. Someone suggests a factorization of Hilbert space into system, tensor, into environment. That gives us a decomposition of the Hamiltonian, system Hamiltonian plus environment Hamiltonian plus interaction Hamiltonian. 
Roughly speaking, the environment Hamiltonian doesn't matter that much, so we don't need to pay attention to it. But both the system Hamiltonians and the interaction Hamiltonians matter a lot. Because we're trying to say two things. Localized states remain localized, and unentangled states remain unentangled. The first of those criteria speaks to the structure of the system Hamiltonian. The second one, the entanglement, speaks to the structure of the interaction Hamiltonian. And interestingly, once you set things up this way and say, I'm going to start with a generic Hamiltonian and try to factorize it into system tensor environment so that it has these nice features, a generic Hamiltonian never does have these nice features. If you just start with a randomly selected, you know, a, a literally random Hamiltonian, okay, randomly selected energy eigenvalues, and you try to decompose it into a system and an environment, such that there are pointer states in the system that remain unentangled with the environment. They don't. There aren't any such states. You can start with any state you want, and it will very rapidly entangle with the environment. So it is an interesting special feature of our world that a classical limit exists at all, which is something to keep in mind. So let me tell you a little bit more about these pointer states that I keep mentioning. Uh, it's decoherence that entangles the system with the environment. And we all know that when you do that, you get a density matrix for the system that you can calculate by tracing out the environment. The thing about the pointer states, remember the pointer states are these coherent classical looking states. And of course, whenever you have a density matrix, you can diagonalize it. There's always a basis in which the density matrix is diagonalized. The thing that is special about the pointer basis is that you know it ahead of time. And there is a non-trivial dynamical statement that if you start in some density matrix and allow it to evolve, what decoherence does is puts the system's density matrix into a diagonal form when expressed in the pointer basis. Okay, so this is a non-trivial dynamical statement, not a trivial mathematical one. The system becomes diagonal in the pointer basis. So that, that particular choice of pointer basis is determined by the dynamics. It's the set of states that remain robust. That is to say, they don't continually get entangled under environment monitoring, under being seen by the environment. So therefore, we have to think a little bit more about what it means to be monitored by the environment. There is some observable that you might want to call a pointer observable that basically is what is being observed by the environment. We're stretching the usual definitions a little bit here because the environment is not a person or an apparatus, it's just the environment. But basically there is some observable in terms of which you can write the interaction Hamiltonian. You can write the interaction Hamiltonian as observer, uh, uh, environment rather, is observing this particular observable of the system. And guess what? For typical systems that we know about in the real world macroscopic life that we all live, it's basically the position, okay? It's basically the position or the physical configuration in space of whatever it is we are looking at. Um, and then there's something called the quantum measurement limit, where the interaction Hamiltonian dominates over the system Hamiltonian. This is the limit in which, if you, when you start with a system with a system state that is not a pointer state, that is some superposition like Schrodinger's cat before you open the box, then the, the quantum measurement limit is the limit in which it's the interaction Hamiltonian that matters. Okay, and then the pointer observable is the one that in the quantum measurement limit commutes with that thing being observed. So position, so basically you're not dramatically changing the system just by looking at it, by measuring it under the environment. All you're doing is becoming entangled with it. So we wanna turn all these words and all this hand waving into some equations so we can make some plots and put it on a computer and things like that. So how do we characterize, how do we measure these two features of classical behavior? Localized systems remain localized and unentangled systems remain unentangled. So what we're gonna ask is, uh, given the potential factorization that we have, what is the right pointer observable to use? So we define a candidate pointer observable, which minimizes its commutator. If the real pointer observable uh, has almost zero commutator with the interaction Hamiltonian, the candidate is gonna be the one that minimizes it as we're going through all the possible factorizations. So we start with an unentangled system and we're gonna let it become entangled. We're gonna measure the entanglement by the entropy. You could use the von Neumann entropy, that's fine, but we're literally gonna put it on a computer and calculate it so it's just calculationally easier to use the linear entropy. It's not gonna matter for the underlying physics. 
And we're going to define something called the pointer entropy. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, go I'm going too fast. Uh, I'm, I'm doing both of these both things on one slide here, which I don't usually do. But the the entanglement is measured by the linear entropy. That is literally the amount of entanglement, one measure of the amount of entanglement between the system and the uh, environment. We're also separately going to measure the localization of the system. So the Earth moving around the sun, its center of mass has a wave function, but that wave function remains very, very localized as the Earth goes around the sun. The Earth is not spread out, all out over its orbit, right? That can be uh, measured by what we call the pointer entropy, which is basically in that diagonal density matrix that we have, how spread out over the diagonal are the states. If you start in one state on the diagonal, it will evolve, but we don't want it to spread out too much. So we characterize that by this number we call the pointer entropy, where PN is just the distribution, probability distribution of the different pointer states. Then if you believe that I have these two numbers, the system entropy and the pointer entropy, then I can minimize them both, okay? That's the Muriology algorithm. For each possible factorization that you can imagine doing between system and environment, you construct the candidate pointer observable, the thing that is closest to a real pointer observable within that factorization. You start with an unentangled state with the system in an eigenstate, of that pointer observable, and you ask, what are the entropies when you let that evolve according to the Schrodinger equation? What is the evolution of the entanglement and the evolution of the localization, the linear entropy and the pointer entropy? And in the space of all possible factorizations, which is a very large space, it takes a lot of time to do this in practice, but you can do it. In the space of all factorizations, the one that is going to be the one we recognize as classical is the one that minimizes the what we call the Schwinger entropy to be honest, we forgot why we called it the Schwinger entropy. We were reading papers by Schwinger and were inspired by them, but that was a long time ago. Uh, this is work I've been doing, I, I've done with my former student, Ashmeet Singh, but I should say, when I say we. Uh, the Schwinger entropy is just the maximum of the linear entropy and the pointer entropy. And so that's our claim. Our claim is that there is a way to sift through all of the possible ways to decompose Hilbert space into system and environment and find the right one on the basis of this classical behavior. And to show you that it works, at least we had one little example. We're very happy if other people wanna do other examples, but we said, all right, we're gonna take two big harmonic oscillators. We're gonna attach a little tiny interaction with them. So we think we know what the right uh, decomposition is, system and environment. And then we're going to do a random unitary, set of unitary transformations that move us away from the correct known classical factorization. And we're gonna plot this thing that we called the Schwinger entropy. And guess what? As we move away from the quasi-classical factorization, the Schwinger entropy does indeed go up by a lot. This is a log plot, right? So the quasi-classical factorization that we thought we knew ahead of time was the right one, is the right one by our uh, criteria that we invented. So therefore we claim that it is actually true that even if all you know about your quantum system is a list of energy eigenvalues, there is a right way to decompose Hilbert space into system and environment so that the system acts classically, which is good. I mean, maybe it's not surprising, but it's nice to know that you can do it in practice. And it does, by the way, I almost hesitate to say this because this is very much work in progress. It does possibly address a question that I know I've had for decades now, which is, why don't we live in momentum space? <laughs> you know, if you, if you grow up using Hamiltonians, where the Hamiltonian is a function of position and momentum, in the fundamental equations of Hamiltonian mechanics, position and momentum are basically equal to each other, right? I mean, not numerically equal, but they're on the same ontological footing. They, they appear similarly in the equations. And yet in the real world, we say we live in three-dimensional space. We, we don't think that we live in momentum space. Why not? Well, remember that we said that to get the classical limit, we need to find out the pointer observable, what is being measured by the environment uh, as a function of the system. And once you do that, you have the uncertainty principles. So you can find a conjugate observable. If you call the pointer observable P, sorry, the pointer observable Q and the conjugate P, then what we find is that the requirement that the system remain localized turns into a requirement about the system Hamiltonian. Namely, that it roughly looks like p squared plus v of q. In other words, it better look like the conjugate observable squared plus whatever function you want 
of the pointer observable. And if you have more than one, then it's going to be P1 squared plus P2 squared, et cetera, plus V of Q1, Q2, Q3. You're allowed to have arbitrary interactions just between the pointer observables, not between the pointer momenta, if you want to have this classical behavior. So the suggestion is, and again, this is still a work in progress, but I think it's on the right track, the thing that breaks the symmetry between position and momenta in classical mechanics is the requirement that the particular classical Hamiltonian you're interested in is the classical limit of a quantum Hamiltonian. And maybe there aren't arbitrary classical limits of quantum Hamiltonians that actually obey our criteria. Maybe the only ones in which that works are ones in which there's a set of observables that you and I would recognize as spatial locations, as positions, not as momenta. So we're working on that to flesh that out, but I think that's an interesting little sidelight of, of what we do here. It, this kind of way of thinking sheds new light on uh, old questions, if you want to think about it that way. There are questions that you just assumed we're part of how nature works and you're not supposed to explain them, that maybe we can start explaining now. Okay, so that was classical behavior. I'm gonna talk about the second consideration for our emergence of everything from the wave function, which is space and locality. Sadly, I was scooped on this one, so I'm gonna give credit to other people who did it before I did, but the basic idea is that in the real world, we have something called quantum field theory. And in quantum field theory, empty space is not boring, right? Empty space is full of modes of quantum fields in their vacuum states. And so we can, and this, there's details here that again, I'm going to gloss over for region, reasons of time, but roughly speaking in quantum field theory, we can decompose Hilbert space into separate factors representing the fields in different regions of space space, good old space. So this is supposed to be space that I have divided into different regions, 3D space, although I drew it as a 2D disk. And I'm writing for each A here, this is a region of space with some modes of a quantum field, and they have their Hilbert space. And the whole Hilbert space is just the tensor product of all of them. Once you do that in ordinary uh, quantum field theory, well, once you do that at all, once you write the, Hamilton, the Hilbert space as a big old tensor product of many little subsystems, then once again, you can write the Hamiltonian in that decomposed form. There's a set of, there's a sum of things that are just self Hamiltonians for the individual regions, two point Hamiltonians between region A and region B, and then three point Hamiltonians, et cetera, okay? In principle, if you didn't know that you were doing quantum field theory and it was local and things like that, you could have interactions between any one region of space and any other region of space. In practice, you don't. In practice, in real world quantum field theory, regions of space only interact with their nearest neighbors. So real world quantum field theory has a very special structure of the Hamiltonian, which presumes a very special decomposition of Hilbert space. If again, if I took a real quantum field theory and just decomposed it in some wildly different way, I would get interactions with all of the different subfactors. Locality is a feature of both the choice of Hamiltonian and the way that we decompose Hilbert space. So one feature of local Hamiltonians is that this series does not go on forever because if I only have a certain finite number of nearest neighbors, I will not have arbitrary interactions at higher points in this Hamiltonian. So this was examined by uh, these young folks from Stanford, Kotler, Pennington, and Renard. And what they found is that, again, if you have a generic Hamiltonian, there will be no factorizations in terms of which that Hamiltonian looks local. That is to say, if I have a bunch of subfactors and I want to say my subfactor only interacts with its nearest neighbors, most Hamiltonians just don't allow that for any factorization at all. Another reminder that the Hamiltonian of the real world is very special. And their second result, which is a little bit more loosey-goosey, but it's mostly on the right track, that when there is a local factorization, it's essentially unique by which we mean you can do some sort of trivial relabelings and things like that, but basically you can find the single right way to decompose Hilbert space so that different factors look like regions of space with respect to which interactions look local. So just like for system versus environment, for finding locality and space within Hilbert space, there is a way to do it. You can find the right way to decompose Hilbert space just by asking that interactions look local.
So that gives you a graph, if Hilbert space is finite dimensional, a graph with little subfactors and then interactions between them. Okay, so the, these are subfactors of Hilbert space, and the edges are defined by interaction Hamiltonians. So credit to them for doing that, but we want to be even more ambitious. We want to say, okay, in the real world, we not only have space, but space moves. Space is dynamical. We learned that from general relativity. Now we're, now we're a little bit scared because it's gravity and so forth, but we're going to do like the dumbest, simplest version of quantum gravity that you can imagine. But we're keeping in mind that the ultimate goal is to derive this equation, right? This is Einstein's equation for general relativity with the geometry of space-time on the left, energy momentum on the right. So we need to figure out how to measure geometry in terms of our entanglement and other such things. You can do that. Again, you can allow yourself to be inspired by what we know is true in the real world in quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, the vacuum is highly entangled. Before, two slides ago, we were talking about interactions. Now we're talking about entanglement of the wave function. Interactions are purely a feature of the Hamiltonian. Now we're looking at a low-lying state, okay? A nearly vacuum state or a completely vacuum state. So now we can talk about the entanglement between different regions. And in, in QFT, every region is entangled with every other region. This is a, the Riesz-Leiter theorem. We'll reassure you of this. But furthermore, you know that nearby regions have a lot of entanglement, because most entanglement is short-ranged. And far away regions have only a little bit of entanglement. So in ordinary QFT, there is a fact that in the vacuum state, there's a relationship between distance and entanglement. We want to turn that around because we're starting with Hilbert space. We know what entanglement is, but we don't know what distance is. So we're going to say, could we define a metric on this space by the amount of entanglement so that nearby means highly entangled? Well, we have to measure what you mean by entanglement. Uh, a quantum field theorist would just look at two-point functions or something like that, but those depend on the operators you're looking at. So a quantum info theorist might use the mutual information we know that when we have two subsystems, P and Q, we can define the entropy of either P or Q. This is the density matrix. That's the entropy. And then the amount of entanglement is uh, quantified by the mutual information. So the mutual information is saying, I have some entropy for subsystem P, some for Q, and some for the whole system. If the two things are not entangled with each other at all, then S of the whole system is just going to be SP plus SQ. So this is going to be zero. But if there's entanglement between them, there is more entropy in the subsystems individually than there is in the combination because of that entanglement. So that shows up as non-zero mutual information. And that is actually an upper bound on the two-point function appropriately normalized. So you should make quantum field theorists happy with this. So we can use this quantity, I of P and Q, to quantify the amount of entanglement between these two subsystems. And we're going to posit that there's a, you can use this mutual information as a metric. You can take the logarithm of it, take minus that, call that the distance. The actual functional form is going to depend on what kind of quantum field theory you have in mind, but that's okay. It doesn't matter for our purposes. Uh, with this onsatz, you now have a distance measure and therefore a metric on that little graph topology that I showed you before. So just to check that this is not completely crazy, in these two examples, what we did is we took two systems where we knew what the entanglement structure was, and we knew what space was. So we sort of uh, knew what qualified as different regions of space. There's a 1D chain and a 2D toric code. And then we forgot that we knew, okay? So we only knew the entanglement structure, and then we could do some applied math and recover what the actual distances were. So these uh, little graphs are telling you that we can in fact recover the fact that the 1D chain is a 1D chain and the 2D toric code is a plane. That's good. You shouldn't be too impressed by this, but at least it's a little bit of a sanity check. Here's what you should be a little bit more impressed by. This is all more or less in the vacuum, right? We're basically finding empty space and, and characterizing it in another way. Now let's perturb it a little bit. So we start with the vacuum or something very close to it, whatever you're using to represent flat space time and perturbing it a little bit. Well, these are things that people have thought about before. So we can borrow a lot of previous technology here. If we decrease the entanglement between two subfactors, 
by what we said before in terms of our emergent metric, that is moving this new sub, this sub factor away from its neighbors. That is going from flat space time to now having a little bit of curvature right there. And in the, the, the onsatz that we want to follow up on and see if it works is, we're going to say that the area, the geometric area around this region, we're going to set proportional to the change in entropy when we do this perturbation. So this is something that would be true if we had a black hole, but we don't have a black hole. We're assuming basically, I should probably pause to let this sink in a little bit more. Um, this is a non-trivial statement. If you are in flat space time in the ground state of a quantum field theory, then it is true that if you have a subregion of space, the entropy of that region is proportional to its area. There are area laws for entropy. But that's not true for a non ground state. If you had an arbitrarily excited state, you could have as much entropy as you want in that region. And in particular, you could make it scale as the volume, not as the area of the boundary. But that's true in theories without gravity. So what we're suggesting here, following people like Ted Jacobson and others, is that when you have gravity, if you try to perturb the quantum state so as to have more entropy in the region, the geometry of space adjusts so that the area remains proportional to the entropy. This is sort of a, a downstream descendant of Ted Jacobson's well-known paper from 1995 on the Einstein equation of state. OK, we're, we're suggesting that there's a difference between theories with gravity and without gravity, namely that the geometry adjusts to keep entropy proportional to area as it is in the vacuum. And once you make that assumption, now you just do math and the math is tricky, but I'm just going to tell you the highlights. Um, you can take that decrement of area, which is a very physical thing, and turn it in the limit as you look at very tiny balls of space into the spatial curvature scalar the Ricci scalar, if you like, at the point P. And then you want to build up space-time. We've been just talking about three-dimensional space. You want to build up space-time from that. That's not unique. You have to do something like choose a gauge in order to know how you want to glue together your different moments of time into a four-dimensional space-time. So we choose synchronous gauge. There's good reasons to do that. When you do that, this spatial curvature at the point P is the zero, zero component of the Einstein tensor at the point P. So therefore, on the left-hand side of Einstein's equation, we are deriving the zero, zero component of Einstein's tensor as something that is proportional to the entropy change under that perturbation. Now let's look at the right-hand side, right? We want to relate uh, the change in entropy to the energy density at that point. Well, what do you mean by energy density? We're not sure. We can use a trick, though. And the trick is via something called the modular Hamiltonian. This is, there's a well-known fact that if you have a density matrix for a system that you know is thermal with some temperature T, then the density matrix takes the form E to the minus H over T, where H is the Hamiltonian. Okay, So even if you don't know what the Hamiltonian is or you don't have a state that is thermal, you can always say for any density matrix, what would the Hamiltonian have to be in order that that density matrix be thermal? So in other words, we define K, called the modular Hamiltonian, as minus the logarithm of the density matrix. So that rho, no matter what it is, whether it's thermal or not, is e to the minus K. And we call that K the modular Hamiltonian, what the Hamiltonian would have to be for the density matrix to be thermal. It is a function of the density matrix. And then you do some playing around with known examples, like you look at the infrared limit and things like that. You can prove a theorem, a very nice little result called the entanglement first law that says that when you take that density matrix and you perturb the overall quantum state, the density matrix of your subsystem also gets perturbed. And the change in entropy of that density matrix of one little subsystem is proportional to the change of the expectation value of the modular Hamiltonian. So this thing that we're looking at, the change in the entropy, is proportional to the change of some kind of energy. And then in an appropriate limit, we look at a conformal field theory and so forth. In the vacuum state, you can show that the change in the expectation value of the modular Hamiltonian really is just the perturbation in the energy density, T00, that you would recognize from classical field theory. 
So I know that was a lot these last couple of slides. There's a rule, right? That like in the last 10 minutes, you're not supposed to be understandable to anybody. So I hope I've achieved that. But maybe to make you get, get some little bit of understanding here, here's the overall picture that we have in mind that we're trying to push forward. The big assumption we start with, the onsatz is here at the top. We're saying that, and this is, like I said, it's following Jacobson, but the difference is that in Jacobson's work, he had space-time. He put space-time in, and he was talking about the entropy of quantum fields. Here, everything is emergent, including space-time itself. That is the big difference. And our ansatz is that the geometry that emerges from this quantum entanglement has the property that under a perturbation, a change in the geometric area is proportional to the change of the entropy of a region. And then it's just math. That change in entropy uh, gets mapped onto the zero, zero component of the left hand of Einstein's equation. The change of entropy gets mapped onto the zero, zero component of the right hand side. And then if your theory is Lorentz invariant, which is a big if, we have not shown you that it is, and that's one of the things we're working on. The only way that G zero, zero can always be proportional to T zero, zero is if G mu nu is proportional to T mu nu for all mu and nu. In other words, the full Einstein's equation. To be super duper honest, we so in, if I was not honest, <laughs> I would say, look, I've derived Einstein's equation just from quantum entanglement. But uh, there's two things to be very clear about. One is we absolutely were working in a very restricted set of circumstances, including perturbation theory. So we're doing weak gravity, okay? We're not doing black holes. We're not doing the Big Bang singularities. We're not solving the black hole information loss problem. We're just looking at weak field gravity. But the other thing is, deriving Einstein's equation isn't that impressive in some sense. Once you think that you're going to have a tensorial relationship between geometry and energy, there aren't that many tensorial relationships you could have. So you're going to get Einstein's equation one way or the other. The impressive thing, if anything, is that you can see it emerge. It's not the answer that is impressive. It's the way that we got there, the journey along the way that maybe is indicative of something. We didn't use any words like string theory or loop quantum gravity or anything like that. We just started with quantum mechanics. And we said, most Hamiltonians just give you nonsense. There's no classical limit, no, no, cla no locality, et cetera. But when you have a good Hamiltonian, it has this property that very plausibly, if you define the metric using entanglement, that emergent metric will obey Einstein's equation. So we can imagine an alternative history of physics in which rather than Einstein inventing relativity and then uh, getting puzzled about quantum mechanics, first people invented quantum mechanics, and then they showed that there's an emergent metric that would obey this equation that they labeled uh, the equation of curved space-time, whatever it is. So here is the program that, again, like I said, it's, it's, it's young, it's just starting, you could crash or burn at any time. But uh, I, I like it, and I think it's a, it's a useful way to think about a quantum-first take on space-time and other issues in uh, the foundations of quantum mechanics. So we start with nothing but a Hilbert space and a Hamiltonian. We figure out how we can carve classicality out of that structure by uh, demanding localization and low entanglement. We can use entanglement between different parts of the wave function to define locality and geometry. And then it seems very easy and natural, uh, lots, lots of work yet to be done, but it seems kind of natural for that in the weak field limit to obey Einstein's equation. So I'm kind of tentatively optimistic that we can keep going and doing harder things like holography and black holes and quantum fields and matter and fermions and things like that. None of that stuff has been put into this framework yet, but I do think that if you think that the world is fundamentally classic, uh, fundamentally quantum mechanical at heart, this kind of program should get all of that out of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean, for a, a really wonderful presentation and talk and, and very clear. I, I can't go through the whole chat right now to tell you all the nice comments we're making along the way, but folks, this is a great time to repost the questions that we didn't get to earlier. So please do post them in the chat. Uh, this way we can bring them back up to, to Sean here and we have plenty of time for a discussion. And uh, the only question is, how am I gonna sort through all, all these? Maybe let's, uh, yeah, maybe let's start with uh, a question around, um, you know, we, one, one generic question, which is, you know, we had this very nice intuition to start from a Hilbert space and understand all of that. What about the initial state? Can you tell us more about, we, we haven't really talked much about what happens with the initial state and what sets uh, the, 
if we had to think about the whole universe here. Yeah, you know, I mean, you want me to do a lot. I'm trying to do something, and uh, <laughs> it's it's uh, there's a lot of questions yet to be answered. I, I do, I, I have a great fondness and 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 uh, interest in understanding better the initial state of the universe. It has to do with the arrow time and the Big Bang and things like that. Um, I all I have within this framework are some very very vague speculations um, about what that how to relate what we're saying here to that question. So the, the honest answer is that for the work we're doing here, we're just assuming the kind of initial state that we need. But really what we're trying to derive are you know, apples falling from trees and the double slit experiment and things like that. We're not trying to derive the wave function of the universe and the Big Bang yet. What I hope is true is that this perspective lets us think about that problem in a different way, right? So rather than thinking about what the metric was doing at the Big Bang or at the beginning of the universe, we can really think about what the quantum state was doing, really and truly it by its own right, not as uh, some way of thinking about functions of metrics or, or anything like that. So I don't really know what the answer is, but I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that this perspective will change the usual way that we think about those questions. OK, thank you, Sean. Um, and uh, let's see, there's quite a few questions. So I apologize if I don't get to your question right away, guys, but, uh, but feel free to bring them back up over time. Um, maybe I, uh, great. Maybe, maybe a question to connect this to some previous seminars we've had on this talk that come more from the many body physics community and the condensed matter community. There's, uh, there's this uh, general understanding that for a generic interacting uh, system, I think somewhat like the one I think I understand you decompose this, the world and space into, uh, as time goes on, generically these systems tend to just thermalize into something understood under the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Can you maybe give us some connection in relation to that? And they're also in those theories, of course, there are exceptions to those, which lead to things like many body localization or localized states, you, you know, because you, there was a lot of discussion of localization. If you help connect those two worlds for us, I think that would be very illustrative. Yeah, no, I think that um... I can see that there are absolutely connections there, and I'm probably not the best person to draw them. My, you know, my condensed matter physics is not really uh, what it could be. Uh, but I do think that you know the the I can I can say thermalization hypothesis, et cetera, are pointing their fingers at something really interesting, both both when they work and in their exceptions, right? I think that the exceptions are kind of non-generic. You have to like make things uh, aligned in the right way. Um, but the, the generic behavior is that if you just have two quantum subsystems, uh, you start them in whatever state you want to start them in, and you let them go, and they will pretty quickly max out their uh, mutual information, the amount of entanglement between them. And so to me, what's interesting is why that's not always true. What are the special features of the world? Um, you know, the, the, the physical world that we live in, you and me, like, we're not many body localized, I don't think, in the way that uh, you know Phil Anderson would have recognized. But somehow the laws of physics allow us to remain localized nevertheless. So uh, unless I'm missing something, like that would be great. I, I don't know. But I, I think that I think the reason why I can remain localized is a different reason um, than in Anderson localization, et cetera. But um, but I don't know. Again, I'm just going to repeat my little mantra that this way of thinking about things, starting nothing from nothing but a set of energy eigenvalues, might shed light on questions that we have been thinking about in other ways. Excellent. Thank you, Sean. I think it's a very interesting open direction and perhaps a good place for people to yeah. work with their research. Um, maybe the next question is going back to about halfway through your talk where you showed the P squared plus V of Q Hamiltonian. I think there was a question from... Uh, Darish, if I'm saying that right, which was around, um, you know, that's very nice, but it's not relativistic. Can you also understand the emergence of the Hamiltonian that has a more complicated form of P of the momentum that is relativistic in some sense? Yeah, you know, it's 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 not even, I, I would hesitate to even call it non-relativistic. It's something even more primitive than that. It's just the basic idea that the variables with respect to which 
interactions are local are the variables that we call the spatial variables. When you have two billiard balls in space, I don't care if they're relativistic or not, they can bump into each other when they're at the same point in space. They do not bump into each other when they have the same momentum or opposite momentum or anything like that. The, the funny thing that we're trying to explain, and we were just happy to do it in a non-relativistic context, but it doesn't, you could easily do it in a more relativistic context, is that there are a set of variables that have this property that, that interactions are local with respect to those variables. And, and we call those variables positions in space. And that's true in relativity or pre-relativity. So that's what we're trying to explain. Thank you, Sean. Uh, maybe a quick question from, from Tom McFarlane. Uh, sorry, Tom, if I'm mispronouncing that. Does imposing the condition of locality implicitly introduce a spatial concept into the emergence of space? Well, you know, there's, there's a question of um, why the world is the way it is, okay? So our philosophy is the following. In the world, as data has shown to us, as our experience has shown to us, there is a feature of locality. Things do exist at locations in space and they interact when they're nearby in space. We're not trying to explain why that is true, although maybe we will. Like our, our proposal is that if you want a classical limit of a quantum Hamiltonian, you're going to get something like locality out of it. Who says you want a classical limit of a quantum Hamiltonian? Like, I, I'm not trying to explain that. <laughs> I mean, there might be an explanation. Maybe it's anthropic or something like that. Maybe in order to get um, complex structures or intelligent agents out, you need some classicality to your quantum dynamics. I don't know. Um, but we're absolutely just assuming that there is something locality that is good and that we want it. And we're using that as a criteria to figure out how to decompose Hilbert space to get it. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. Um, and I think there was some a few related questions from Jeffrey Cohn. Is there a global time that governs the Schrodinger equation? And there was an earlier question I saw from people around sort of the discretization of time and or space as, as you get because of this finite number of states in the Hilbert space. Maybe you can. Right. Tell yeah. Us. So this is another this. Is a, I, I should actually put this in the talk because everyone always asks this. And it's a very good question that, that should be asked. Um, we're talking about the emergence of space. Sometimes I, you know, simplify it by saying the emergence of space time, but really what is emerging is space in our way of doing it. Uh, in our approach, time is just fundamental, which has a couple of implications. So we need it to be fundamental for our approach to work because we start from the Schrodinger equation, right? H psi equals I D by D T psi. There's a T in there, there's no X's, there's no space. That can emerge from the wave function, but T is right there in the Schrodinger equation. It is continuous, it goes from minus infinity to infinity, and you might say, well, but I want time to emerge, so I think we should start with something like the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, which just says H psi equals zero. From our perspective, if you believe the, the point of view that I was pushing, the Wheeler-DeWitt equation tells you nothing. It just says you're in a single state. What can you do with that? You cannot ask how to decompose Hilbert space, what kind of tensor factorization, et cetera, because all of those questions we were asking depended on dynamics as a function of time, depended on the energy eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. And if H psi equals zero, there's only one eigenvalue that matters, which is zero. <laughs> so maybe there's a future even more ambitious program in which both time and space are emergent and discrete very, very possible, uh, but we just didn't look at that. And by the way, I do want to say that even though what we looked at here was effectively a discretization of space, that is not implicit in the program. That is not a starting point. And in fact, I think it would be a bad starting point because we know there are things like holography and black hole complementarity. There are things in quantum gravity that have non-local features. So one of the nice things about this approach is that we, we derived a kind of locality and discreteness of space in the regime where things should be local, namely the weak fields and, and uh, small perturbations of flat space. But there's plenty of room to also include non-local interactions when you get to strong field gravity. So it's completely compatible with that because discreteness of space itself is not a starting point. Thank you, Sean. And, and thank you guys for posting the questions. I'm 
trying to double time here between listening to Sean and, and reading your questions. So uh, please do repost them as we come through them. Uh, I think the next question is from Quantum Leap. Uh, it's, a, it's a favorite phrase of mine too. So that was my dissertation and Sean and I were just talking about that right before this catching and reversing quantum jumps. The question is around, um, and it, the chat just scrolled for me here. So let, let's see if I can bring it right back up here. Okay. Here we go. In thermodynamics, the entropy of the system increases with time. Um, so how is it impacting the entanglement of the system as time goes on? And, and maybe that's related to um, this, this uh, new notion around the second law of not thermodynamics, but second law of complexity that has become, I guess, increasingly popular. Maybe you can tell us a bit about that. Yeah, well, I, so I don't know about that last bit. Um, sorry about that. But I, but I can say that you have to be careful about entropy. I'm a big fan of the second law of thermodynamics and entropy increasing and things like that. But as we all know, there are different definitions of the word entropy and they apply and are relevant and are helpful in different circumstances. For the arrow of time and for the fact that entropy is increasing leading to things like aging or memory or causality or things like that, really the entropy we have in mind is some coarse grained classical Boltzmannian kind of entropy. Uh, von Neumann points out that the entanglement gives rise to a different kind of entropy, the von Neumann entropy, et cetera. But we have to be very, very careful because, you know, following everything I've said here, um, if you give me a quantum state and just the quantum state as a vector in Hilbert space, and you say, how much entanglement does it have? How much entropy does it have? There's either no answer to that or the answer is zero because how you divide Hilbert space into subsystems will dramatically affect the amount of entanglement you have. That is to say, a single quantum state can look very, very entangled in one decomposition and not entangled at all in another decomposition. So when you say that entropy increases, uh, if you want to interpret that as a statement about entanglement, you have to specify ahead of time what your decomposition is. And I think that can be done. I think you can, you can all work it out and make it all compatible, et cetera. I'm just saying that in this quantum context, you have to be a little bit more careful um, about what your starting point is before you just say entropy is increasing. Wonderful. Thank you, Sean. And a question, I think, from Shashi Kumar and, and someone else. Uh, there was a lot of discussion around black holes and what role do we do you expect black holes to play and around their singularity? Is that a real thing? Is it not a real thing? Well, you know, I don't know what's real and what's not real in the universe, but yeah. black holes are real. I don't know whether singularities are real or not. I've never been inside a black hole. Um, you'll notice that I may have mentioned it a couple times, but the idea of a singularity uh, inside a black hole did not play a major role in anything that I said, both because at the technical level, my actual derivations are in the weak field limit where there are no singularities. You're not inside a black hole but also because I think that the issues of emergent space-time and quantum gravity hit you long before you get to the singularity. Uh, so sometimes the existence of singularities in general relativity is used as motivation for trying to seek a quantum theory of gravity. My motivation is just that quantum mechanics exists, and so does gravity. And so I think we need a theory of quantum gravity, whether or not we were worried about singularities. Uh, I should say one more thing. Let me say one, one other thing which is that even though I don't know the once and for all correct way to describe black holes in this context, one of the benefits of taking seriously the idea that Hilbert space is finite dimensional and that you're using the Schrodinger equation is that there can't be any real singularities. The Schrodinger equation is, is very solvable, <laughs> right? You can, you can just write down the Schrodinger equation in the energy eigenbasis and solve it exactly. Um, and you will never hit a boundary to space or time or anything like that. So I think there's a lesson there, which is that the singularities of classical GR will go away once we understand quantum gravity, even if we don't currently know how they will. Thank you, Sean. And a question from uh, May Janic. All of this sounds very consistent with the general many worlds uh, interpretation philosophy that our reality is just a vector in the larger Hilbert space and everything else is an emergent phenomena. Uh, was this the motivation behind for you behind this work? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, it partly was. You know, look, I, I grew up as a cosmologist thinking about 
the early universe and dark matter and dark energy and so forth. Um, I got interested in the foundations of physics because of the cosmological question of the origin of the arrow of time. Why is the early universe low entropy in, in Boltzmann's sense? And that got me you know, to finally take seriously foundational questions in quantum mechanics. And so I, I think that Everett is the right way to go. And I thought that through and you know, wrote papers about that. And I do think that even most Everettians kind of cheat when they write down a set of classical variables and then construct a wave function using them. Uh, what right do you have to pick that particular representation of the wave function? So it is thinking about the foundations of quantum mechanics, taking them seriously that got me thinking about, okay, how does all this classical world outside emerge from that? Um, but meanwhile, I was, I was also thinking about uh, immersion space time and black holes and Jacobson's uh, equation of state work, and it all just fitted together pretty nicely. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Sean. Um, maybe here are three more quick questions. So is there, uh, from Maya Benowitz, is there a covariant approach to the quantum first program that does attempt to derive the wave function of the universe? Um, by... Uh, I don't know if we can do Q and A here back and forth, but I, if you mean covariant uh, that you're treating time and space on an equal footing, um, I don't know of one. There might very well be one. Uh, like I said, I'm just trying to you know take things one step at a time. So I'm helping myself to a universal time coordinate T. I will mention that the fact that we have a time coordinate and use it does not necessarily imply that that time coordinate is preferred, okay? The example I'd like to use is, I can always uh, just do classical Maxwell's equations, which are as relativistic as you come, but I can pick a reference frame and I could write down the Hamiltonian for the electromagnetic field and I could solve that equation and it would be Maxwell's equations. It's a perfectly Lorentz invariant theory that I just happen to have written down in a non-Lorentz invariant form. So I think that's what I'm trying to do here. I'm certainly using a non-Lorentz invariant form for the equations as I currently understand them, um, hoping that at the end of the day, I will come up with some good reasons why the right theory should be Lorentz invariant. If it eventually turns out that it would be better to work in a Lorentz invariant or covariant form from the start, then I would love that, that'd be great. But I, I just don't know how to do it right now. So I'm starting with the simpler thing. Excellent, thank you, Sean. Um, and maybe we'll take two more questions here since we're, we're uh, really peppering you here today. And, and there are way more questions in the chat, by the way, that I'm not going to be able to get to. I apologize to each and every one of you. Thank you for putting in the time today. And we'll, we'll try to make as many here in the last few minutes we have. Um, a lot of the audience uh, is uh, our physicists and scientists and chemists and so on uh, who are involved with quantum computing and quantum computers today. So there was a few questions around this topic of uh, you know, are, can quantum computers help or what would be the implications around the connection between this kind of work and research and in quantum computing, which, as you mentioned, you know, has roots in quantum information theory and, and so on? Well, I think that there are sort of spiritual connections, but no direct technical ones that I know of. And, and yet another area where I would love to uh, be proven wrong about that. Um, in quantum computing, as I understand it, for the most part, you have, you're in the nice, happy situation that you're usually in in physics where you know what the right way to factorize your systems is. You know what is the system, what is the environment, and things like that. Um, so you don't have to worry about this foundational question of how you find that. And so therefore, there's no direct connection. So the, the optimistic point of view would be that there's a way of asking yourself, can you take the physical systems that we know and love and we use to build quantum computers from and conceptualize them differently by looking at different factorizations of Hilbert space? You know, like we said, what is entangled in one factorization is not entangled in another one, or what is local in one is not local in another one, et cetera. Could the freedom that quantum mechanics gives us to choose different factorizations of Hilbert space somehow inspire us to build more effective physical quantum computers. I, I, I wouldn't promise you that that's true, but I can't promise you it's not true. And if it, if it is, it would be really interesting. So please do think about it and let me know. Excellent. Thank you, Sean. Um, 
and and maybe another direction is this, you know you did some simulations of these models um, that that's something that at least is close to my heart in terms of doing mostly many body things but uh, maybe one day that would be an opportunity as well when it comes um, great there were quite a few questions from uh, people who are entering the field or entering this line of research and want to go deeper. Um, and so uh, I, I don't have the person's name in front of me right now, but can we, uh, where, where can we go, where can we go to go deeper into this line of research? Ah, it always depends on what you mean by this line of research, how narrowly you define it. Uh, I have myself written a couple of review slash overview papers. Um, sketching out the whole project. One was called Reality as a Vector in Hilbert Space, and another paper was called Mad Dog Everettianism that I wrote with Ashmeet Singh. And we've written many papers along the way that, that look at different aspects of this problem. Uh, we look at, you know, black holes. Uh, we, there's a black hole firewall paper. There's some papers on cosmology and quantum circuits. There's some papers on quantum muriology and entropy and, and emergent space time with Charles Tsao and others. So read my papers is always the first answer. And within those papers, you'll find references for background reading. Um, there's, you know, understanding decoherence is very important. Understanding some of the basics of um, quantum mechanics and, and density matrices and entanglement measures and things like that. But look, honestly, the nice thing is that the math is not that hard. Even the physics is not that deep. Like most of these questions could have been asked in the 1950s. Like it's not cutting edge uh, quantum field theory stuff. The exception to that is, of course, you would like to derive quantum field theory from these kinds of methods. And it's a little bit tricky because you're including gravity from the start. OK, so among the let, let me rather than telling you what resources to read, they're basically standard resources on quantum mechanics and decoherence and quantum info. OK, those are the resources. But the questions to keep in mind when you're thinking about this, um, following up on Maya's question, why is there Lorentz invariance at all? Why does that pop out? Is Lorentz invariance exact or is there some small correction to it that maybe could be experimentally tested? Why do you have field theory? If you have locality, okay, why are quantum fields the way that locality is implemented? Uh, is the metric we derive from entanglement the same metric that defines geodesics on which test particles move? Um, how do gauge fields and fermions and all that stuff fit into this? How do you go beyond locality to think about uh, complementarity and holography and things like that? Can you use this formula, this formulation to think about de sitter space rather than anti de sitter space and its holographic aspects? So there are a lot of questions that we're still trying to answer. There's no way that I'm going to answer them all uh, before I die. So I encourage other people to think about them and uh, let me know if they make progress. Wonderful. And the de sitter space was a question also in the chat. So I think I think we've touched on that now. Um, excellent. And maybe Sean, seeing as we have had 25 minutes of questions here and we're 15 minutes over time, I think maybe this is the moment where uh, we leave it to you to share any final words you may want with us before we go on to thank everyone. You know, I'm, I'm very happy that people are, are interested in this stuff. You know, I think that uh, as I'm thinking here just in the last 30 seconds, uh, there's a whole bunch of things I would like to be true about this perspective on things. What, you know, one motivation I've had is that this is a little bit grandiose, but if you'll excuse me, because it's the very end of the talk, um, you know, progress in fundamental physics has slowed down, right? Because we haven't discovered any fun new particles or principles or dark matter candidates or anything like that. Is it possible that some of the foundational questions that derive that drive the field, like dark energy or the hierarchy problem, the cosmological constant problem, things like that, do they, do they have different formulations if you think about them from this perspective? I know that people like Tom Banks and Willie Fischler have tried to uh, cast a different light on those problems. But you know, if you could connect the hierarchy problem to the emergence of space time, that's a longstanding ambition that I would have. And, and you know, I, I just hope that all the young people out there are, are ambitious enough to think big about these problems rather than just, you know, throwing out this or that paper that you can write just because you can write it, really think about what are the most important contributions we can make and what are the most important questions we have yet to answer. Sean, thank you very much for the inspiring message and the absolutely wonderful talk. There's there's way too many comments to summarize it, but I know people said they're going to go back and rewatch it and 
And uh, thank you again for accepting our invitation and uh, for the wonderful presentation. Folks, it's always a pleasure to have you here. We appreciate uh, the time and uh, energy in the chat, especially today. Uh, so with that, this talk will stay recorded so you can go back and rewatch it and uh, catch up with Sean. But uh, to know what's coming up, subscribe to the Kiss Kid YouTube channel to catch Sean. Uh, I think your weekly Mindscape podcast is a great place to stay connected. And uh, with that, we will see you next Friday at noon Eastern time.